So, hi everybody, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, my name is Jeffrey Pennington. I'm going to be talking today about some work that I have done earlier this year at Stanford in collaboration with Richard Socher and Christopher Manning on a new unsupervised learning algorithm for word representations. Uh, but before I get uh, too deep into the details of the model, I wanted to just um, highlight what <clears throat> Uh, I've come to believe are sort of the three most important high-level um, insights that we've gained by working on this project. And the, the first of them is that word vector spaces have substructure. And this substructure is typically much more intricate than the basic clustering of similar or related words that by now we're quite familiar with. Second is that I believe it's very important to design algorithms with that structure in mind. So this applies both to the design of word vector learning algorithms, as I'll be describing today, but also, and probably more importantly, to algorithms that utilize word vectors in downstream tasks. And I don't think this is something that people have devoted much attention to in the community. And third, just wanted to point out that oftentimes older models actually do a lot better than you might think they do. And this is sort of a high level point, but the specific reason that I mention this is um, because I think there's been a drift in the community away from some older matrix factorization schemes for learning, learning word vectors. But actually it turns out that LSA does actually surprisingly well, as I'll show you later. Okay, so I'm going to use these three uh, insights as sort of a framework to guide the rest of this talk. And first, let me describe uh, what I mean by uh, word vector space substructure. So I think uh, by now probably all of you have seen plots like this, where there are word vectors displayed in some two-dimensional plot, and typically there will be a cluster of related words. In this case, I've shown the nearest neighbors to frog as being toad, and then lizard is sort of close by, and maybe house is a lot farther away. Um, but of course, this is just a uh, sort of toy model I cooked up. But I want to show you some data from a, you know, a, a new state-of-the-art word vector learning algorithm for, for nearest neighbors. So here's a preview from the model that I'll be describing shortly for the nearest words to frog. If you query our model and ask, this question, the result will be frogs, followed by toad, latorio, leptodactylidae, rana, lizard. And actually, when I first saw this, I was a little bit concerned about the presence of these really esoteric words. But a quick Google image search revealed that actually uh, these things are all frogs, or related to frogs. I think one of them is a, a genus of a certain frog species. <clears throat> but the, the upshot here is just that um, it's possible with these unsupervised learning methods with large vocabularies to actually um, acquire knowledge that extends sort of far beyond ordinary human knowledge and vocabulary, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, here's another example. If we query the model for the nearest words to this five-digit number, 21415, which is the model regards as just another word, it knows nothing about the fact that it's actually a number, one might hope that the result would be a list of maybe five-digit numbers, or even better, numbers that are close to it on the number line. And indeed, this is what happens. But I think much more interesting than the fact that the first few numbers are also five-digit numbers is the fact that actually the first uh, 3,000 or so nearest neighbors are all five-digit numbers in this case. And <clears throat> I think this is really interesting because it highlights Models that are trained with very large vocabularies can get very, very dense structures, very dense clusters of um, word embeddings that uh, points to the fact that, that well, <clears throat> there's probably some interesting structure that generated that. 
And in this case, I was sort of interested, so I, I tried to look into it. And I think in this case, these numbers actually correspond to gene IDs from some online genetic database. And um, <clears throat> on the one hand, I think it's pretty cool that this unsupervised learning method can uncover the presence of such a database in the corpus, which might have been very hard to know about otherwise. But also, it opens up the possibility to uh, select on these numbers and, for example, try to study properties of this, of this genetic database by looking at these vectors, potentially finding some uh, hidden relationships that you might not know about between these genetic sequences. Of course, that's nothing that I did. I just pointed it out as something that might be fun to do. Um, but actually, what I want to do in this talk is not discuss nearest neighbors, except to point out that actually I think that's a very, very bad way of probing word vector spaces and analyzing word vectors. It's something that has been done a lot in the community, but <clears throat> the main limitation to doing this is that nearest neighbors don't fully illuminate the substructures that are often present in word vector spaces. And um, this is just simply because uh, Nearest neighbor measures are typically uh, Euclidean distance or cosine similarity. They're single scalars. They're a single number that is meant to summarize the very complex uh, linguistic similarities that exist between two words that <clears throat> are, so, um, are so complicated that you couldn't imagine actually summarizing it with one number, yet that's sort of what you do when you look at the Euclidean distance between two word vectors. On the other hand, these word vectors are inherently multidimensional objects, some d-dimensional vectors, and as such, there's a natural candidate for a, a higher dimensional object to summarize their relationship, <coughs> and that's just the vector difference between those two word vectors. And um, so let me give you some illustrations of, of what this might look like. So uh, this is from our model. On the left are some five-digit numbers, and on the right are some uh, U.S. cities. These five-digit numbers are from a separate subset than the ones I showed earlier. These are actually postal codes for the corresponding U.S. cities on the right. And you can see that um, the sort of vector difference between uh, each pair is roughly the same. The vector pointing between them, represented by the dotted line, is um, more or less the same between these various pairs, which indicates that, you know, somehow this, this vector is is capturing some of the abstract concept that relates a city to its postal code. Here, here's another example. These are triplets of adjectives, comparative superlatives, so a slow, slower, slowest, short, shorter, shortest, etc. cetera. And, and these form um, triangles that are, are roughly similar in the space, the same size and angles. Of course, I'm <clears throat> not the first person to observe such structures. Um, I think Maybe the first observation was back in 2005, but uh, they really came to the forefront last year when uh, Mikolov et al. introduced a quantifiable test for the presence of these linear substructures. Uh, and that test is uh, word analogies. So let me talk briefly about them. I think by now the <coughs> canonical example is uh, man is to woman as king is to what? And so what we want to do is ask our model, our set of word vectors, what the answer is to this question, and to do it uh, quantitatively. And so how do we do that? Well, suppose we have uh, these word vectors for those three words, and we can uh, just plot those in a 2D plane. And then <clears throat> we can suppose that the vector separating man from woman is capturing some of this uh, abstract knowledge about this concept of gender. <clears throat> and if we make that hypothesis, then we could uh, <clears throat> answer this question simply by translating that vector up so it begins at king. And, <clears throat> and then we could ask, well, what does that translated vector point to now? And we can answer that question easily by taking king minus man plus woman, in this case, the result being 0.7, 0.8. And then we can ask, <clears throat> which word in our vocabulary has a vector that lives closest to that point? And if the answer is queen, then we get this analogy question correct. So just to say this slightly more formally, given <clears throat> the analogy A is to B as C is to what, we can answer it by taking the argmax of the cosine similarity 
between uh, the vectors for B minus A plus C and some probe vectors X as you scan through the vocabulary. Okay, so this is really great. We have a quantitative method for evaluating the presence of uh, substructures in the word vector space. But what we haven't done is said anything about how do we actually learn a set of word vectors that has that property in the first place. So that's what I'd like to discuss now. So <clears throat> said another way, how can we actually encode meaning in vector differences? How can we, uh, how can we train a set of word vectors so that man minus woman actually <clears throat> encodes something about this concept of gender? And I'm going to argue that the crucial insight in doing that is <clears throat> this observation that ratios of co-occurrence probabilities can encode meaning. So let me give you <clears throat> an example to show you how this might work. So let's take uh, the word ice and ask what the probability is that given ice, some other words, x, might co-occur with it. Now, <clears throat> if, uh, if x is, say, solid, which is a property of ice, we might expect that probability would be relatively large. Likewise, if it's gas, which is not a property of ice, it might be smaller. Since ice is a form of water, it might be big. Or if it's some random other word, maybe it's, maybe it's small. Similarly, we could do the same thing with the word steam. In this case, everything is the same, except the roles of solid and gas have been reversed. But now we can do this great thing of taking their ratio. Because in the ratio, <clears throat> any, uh, any word x that's a property of both ice and steam is going to cancel out. And, like, and similarly, if, if x is some random other word related to neither ice nor steam, then it'll also cancel out. So in the ratio, all of this noise that's not related to the things that actually distinguish ice from steam cancels away. And moreover, <clears throat> the actually discriminating terms get accentuated. So what we have here is basically a discriminator that <clears throat> tells us how ice and steam differ without focusing in on any of the specific properties that they share. So to say that another way, this thing is sort of a quantitative measure and some crude approximation of this concept of thermodynamic phase. So <clears throat> in that way, this ratio of probabilities uh, encodes, at least in some crude way, um, some kind of meaning. So <clears throat> let's take that for granted and ask the following question. How can we take that meaning and push it into the vector space? And I think the, um, the simplest answer to that question is with a log bilinear model. So uh, heuristically, we could take the dot product of word vector i into that for word, for, for word j and demand that it equal the log of the conditional probability of their co-occurrence. And if we do that, and if we train a model so that this equation is satisfied exactly, then uh, this second equation will also hold. It follows from the first just by a single line of algebra using the fact that the log of a ratio is equal to the difference of the logarithms. Um, the second equation is really interesting, though, because especially <clears throat> if you think of a is being equal to ice, and B is being equal to steam, then um, you have this difference of ice minus steam on the left-hand side, which is, which is some vector into which you can dot other probe word vectors. So as X scans through the vocabulary, you can dot word vector for X into this constant W <coughs> for ice minus W for steam vector. And what you'll get out on the right-hand side is the log of exactly this ratio that on the previous slide I argued was encoding meaning. So in this way, you take this meaningful quantity on the right-hand side and push it into this vector difference on the left-hand side. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, in the previous slide, that was sort of just a heuristic. This is actually the model that uh, we train. And it's basically the same, except that uh, instead of having um, a single vector for word and context words. We introduce a separate vector, W tilde, for the context words. It's not strictly necessary, but it helps uh, with optimization slightly. We also introduce some bias terms, B, which basically allow us to exchange uh, 
the conditional probability, Pij, from the previous slide with Xij, which are sort of the raw co-occurrence counts. But most importantly, we've introduced this weighting function, f of uh, Xij. And uh, so we have a weighted least squares problem. And uh, f has the crucial property that it vanishes when its argument is equal to zero. And that's a necessity <clears throat> in, in order that the logarithmic divergence inside the parentheses that happens whenever xij goes to zero is canceled by this factor outside of the parentheses. And f hat must or should have another crucial property, which is that <clears throat> when xij gets large, uh, fij, f of xij doesn't also grow too large. Um, and this is so that you don't overweight <clears throat> Uh, cases where both i and j are frequent words, like of and the, which also co-occur very frequently, but maybe don't carry uh, so much information. Okay, so uh, that's the model. And how do we evaluate it? Well, the main way we evaluate it is with this word analogy task um, by uh, Mikolov et al. And uh, this is uh, just a task that's split into two broad subcategories. Um, the top half are sort of semantic analogy questions, on the bottom are more syntactic. And the idea is just to use the first three columns to predict the fourth column. There's something like 20,000 analogy questions in this data set, and it's split roughly evenly between the two broad categories. Okay, so how do we do? Um, <clears throat> so here I've organized uh, a comparison with a variety of other models that have been proposed in <clears throat> at various stages in the last year or so. Um, and and, the, and the, the sort of roughly grouped into models of the same uh, size. And as you can see, Glove consistently is outperforming the uh, other models. Um, just to say a little bit about what they are, uh, SG is the Skipgram model and SIBO is the continuous bag of words model from the word to vec package. Uh, VLBL, IVLBL are very similar models, but trained with noise contrastive estimation. Um, HPCA is a Hellinger PCA matrix factorization method. Uh, the SVD models are also matrix factorization schemes that we implemented. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to highlight point three now, that older models are often better than you think. Um, so actually this SVDL model is basically equivalent to LSA. And as you can see, it's, it's not too shabby. It, it doesn't do quite as well as word to vec or glove. But actually, it's, it's not doing too bad. And um, actually, the performance is as good as the original results reported in the first uh, paper on the Skipgram model. Subsequent iterations have improved the hyperparameter selection. And word to vec does better now. But originally, this is about as well as it did, just as good as LSA. <laughs> but I think more impressive um, is how well LSA actually does on uh, these word similarity evaluation metrics. So here we evaluate on four different data sets. I won't go into them. I get probably many of you are familiar with them, or at least familiar with WordSim 353. Um, as you can see, LSA does, does very well. Not quite as well as Glove, but better than word to vec even. <clears throat> so um, with that, let me just wrap up and say that the code and uh, pre-trained word factors, as well as the discussion forum, are available at this website. And uh, I'd just like to thank you all for listening. It's a great question, and, and I think the answer depends on how one has designed the word vector learning algorithm. And in my case, I designed it specifically so that vector differences would be the objects that are encoding information in the model. And in that case, using vector arithmetic addition and subtraction is definitely the correct thing to do. With, with other models, like with word to vec they were never explicit about 
how they were trying to encode the information. But it turned out that their model also is basically a log by linear model and also had this property. But it certainly would be possible to develop other word vector learning algorithms which didn't try to push information into vector differences per se, but into maybe some higher order interactions, in which case you would try to probe the model <coughs> not with vector differences to study analogies, but with some more complicated function. So you're using a nonlinear function of the observations, the, the log of the, the co-occurrence counts. Does that effectively um, reduce your algorithm options to batch algorithms um, as opposed to the, like the online algorithms that are used for word to vec And does that bother you? So <clears throat> I view that as, a, as yes, first of all, yes. Um, I don't believe it's because I'm taking the logarithm. It's just because I have to collect the co-occurrence counts a priori. Uh, the nonlinear function I don't think has anything to do with it, unless I've misunderstood your question. We but, split it up <clears throat> as an addition. But the point is, yes, you have to collect everything a priori, so you, uh, 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 you actually have the benefit of aggregating global statistics about the corpus, which actually means that <clears throat> while the initialization stage might take slightly longer, um, you're actually optimizing towards a more global optimum and can be much more efficient in the long run by doing so. Do you think um, it makes sense or is it possible to uh, extend these models from words to sentences or phrases? Well, <clears throat> one of the problems with studying longer phrases is just that sparsity ends up really killing you. Um, and you'll just have very few, you know, single digit numbers of counts for the number of times various sentences or phrases co occur with one another. Um, so I, I think to move towards phrases with a model like this, really one should look at <clears throat> sort of composing the constituent word vectors rather than trying to learn phrase vectors or sentence vectors uh, in a similar way. Well, that's the main question. <laughs> I think if we knew how to do that, it would solve a lot of the problems in the field. Other questions? Okay, well, let's uh, thank you all for your time.